let me begin then. So uh, the idea behind this session was just one simple Google search. So uh, I have been speed cubing for uh, maybe two, three years for now. And uh, I've been using a lot of algorithms to solve the Rubik's Cube. Uh, one question that often came to my mind was, why did those algorithms work the way they did? There has to be some reason behind that. And I was interested in knowing the mathematics behind that. And uh, it was just one Google search that gave me a lot of resources that I tried to read. And uh, that is just, it is just something that I wanted to share with all of you. So yeah, let's proceed. So in the context of a Rubik's Cube, uh, an algorithm is just a set of moves that you do on the Rubik's Cube. Uh, in a general context, you must have heard of an algorithm being a set of instructions that you would do to accomplish some certain task. Uh, in this context, I would call that a method. A uh, method is something that I use that is a set of instructions. Uh, it may be algorithms or it may be just pure logic that I use. And uh, I do a set of moves on the Rubik's Cube. And uh, finally, my goal is to solve the Rubik's Cube. So uh, it is just a matter of English usage. Uh, just that these two words have two different meanings in this context. So the bottom line is an algorithm is just a set of moves that you do on a Rubik's Cube. Uh, but is it any set of moves that I do on a Rubik's Cube which will be of interest to me? Well, uh, if I just scramble my Rubik's Cube, uh, that is also a set of moves I do. But uh, I'm interested in those set of moves which can uh, permute only some pieces on the Rubik's Cube in a way I desire. So I don't want all pieces moving randomly. I just want some pieces to move in a way I desire. That is something that will be really useful in solving a Rubik's Cube. So uh, I will begin by talking about a few methods which are used to solve the Rubik's Cube. Uh, these ones are the most popular ones which are used to solve the Rubik's Cube. You have their names along with the names of the inventors in the brackets. Uh, the CFOP method or the Friedrich method is the most popular method to solve the Rubik's Cube. I use it, and uh, many people I know use it, and even most world record holders use that method, primarily because it has a good balance of intuition and algorithms. So uh, it's not that the other three methods are inferior to that or anything. Uh, it's just that learning Friedrich method is pretty easy. But on the whole, all the four methods uh, are equally strong in the sense that uh, if you're into speed cubing or speed solving, uh, all of these four methods will help you become equally fast at solving the Rubik's Cube. So uh, I will go into the CFOP method right now. So I'm guessing the picture is pretty explanative. The first stage is that you form a cross with two by one blocks, solved blocks that you can see here on all the four lateral sides of the cube. Uh, the next stage is to finish this entire layer fully so that you can see something like this in the second picture. So the first two stages are pretty intuitive. Uh, so to start the Rubik's Cube, to start solving the Rubik's Cube, I actually have to find out, I have to search for pieces on the Rubik's Cube and uh, figure out how I can join them in this way. So uh, that's, that's about the first two stages. And the last two stages, are just purely algorithm dependent. That is, you need not have any sort of intuition while you are uh, aboard with the last two stages. Uh, because if you go to any website that teaches you how to solve a Rubik's Cube, and if you just look for CFOP method, uh, and if you type OLL or PL, which is the last two stages basically, uh, you will find 57 cases of OLLs and 21 cases of PLLs. Basically, 57 different situations where uh, if you do one single algorithm, your yellow, your yellow layer will be solved. And after that, if you do, you will have 21 cases. And if you do one single algorithm, your entire cube will be solved. So it, it is just a matter of uh, memorizing those algorithms uh, when it comes to the last two stages. But one, one thing that was bothering me was uh, what is the reason behind how these algorithms came up? If you just memorize them, you can use them to solve it. But why does it come up in the first place? So that is the subject of interest today. Even uh, how many of you guys have actually uh, tried to solve the Rubik's Cube and uh, you ended up uh, solving one layer of the Rubik's Cube? I'm pretty sure some of you must have tried that out.
So you must have uh, solved one layer of the Rubik's cube. And uh, if you make attempts to solve another layer of the Rubik's cube, your main problem would have been, uh, I was able to solve the first layer. But when I start solving the second layer as well, uh, pieces in my first layer get disturbed. That is one major problem you must have faced. Uh, initially, when I was first learning, I also was kind of irritated by that. And that is one of the main reasons why I decided to learn it completely. So uh, yeah, so I will demonstrate one thing here. Um, yeah. So uh, I use the CFOP method to solve the Rubik's cube. And uh, maybe I could just show it to you so that you have a better idea of how it is done. So this is some random scramble of the cube. So you can see that the cube is kind of scrambled here. And uh, so the first step, as I told you guys, was to form a cross. In that picture, you saw a white cross. And even I usually do a white cross. But uh, you can pretty much start with any color. It's completely your choice. So yeah. So the first stage was to form a cross along with uh, a couple of things. I'll show you here. Yeah. So this is the cross. I hope it's visible. And uh, you can see that uh, two by one blocks are formed here, red, blue, orange, and green. On all the four lateral sides, uh, there are uh, blocks like these that are formed along with the cross. So uh, that is the first stage. And uh, in the second stage, basically, you try to complete this entire layer. So for that, what I do is uh, there are four different slots, if you can see here. There's one slot here. There's another slot here, this one, and this one. So there are four different slots. And if I fill all of those slots, I can finish this entire layer. I hope you guys are with me in this. So uh, let's say I take this example. I have the blue and the red uh, slot here. So I have to look for a blue, red, white piece here, and a blue, red piece here. So I search for where those pieces are. I found them. And I fit them wherever they are supposed to go. Similarly, I do the same thing for all the other four slots. For instance, this is the green orange slot. And uh, I saw where the green and the orange pieces are. And so I put them wherever they are supposed to go. Similarly, I do it for all the, the other two slots as well. So there you go. That is the second stage. So till this point, it was. Uh, rather intuitive rather than uh, doing fixed algorithms. Uh, there are a few techniques that you can use to solve the, the first two layers fully, but uh, they are mostly intu intuition based. It takes you some practice to get accustomed to this. But beyond this point, as you can see here, there is uh, some configuration of pieces here on the yellow layer. Uh, this, is, this configuration is one of those 57 cases that I told you. So there is one single algorithm for this. If I just do that algorithm, it gets solved. Similarly, uh, the other, uh, the next stage here is the permutation stage, where the yellow layer is solved, but I have to permute these pieces all around the queue. Again, there's one single algorithm for this. If I do that, queue gets solved. So uh, CFOP method uh, is rather a, a matter of learning algorithms towards the last two stages, which you can use to solve the queue. But why exactly those algorithms work is something we're interested in today. So yeah. So uh, before we go into those algorithms, it's important that you learn some notations about the Rubik's Cube. Uh, let's say you, you just hold the Rubik's Cube right in front of you. The face that is directly in front of you is the front face. and uh, the face that's towards the right of you is the right face. The face that is towards the left is the left face, and and so on. It's it's just it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing complicated here to understand. Uh, also, one more thing before I proceed, uh, I'd ask you guys to uh, look up some online simulator of a Rubik's cube. So uh, actually, I tried using one of those, and uh, it turns out that it wasn't that user friendly. So uh, you can you can use it if you want, but I would rather recommend you not using it because it takes a lot of time to uh, 
do moves in that but otherwise if you have a fully solved normal rubik's cube with you you can just go ahead and try out some stuff which i will be explaining later so yeah this is about the notation uh, you can see that uh, the rubik's cube is just like a normal cube it has eight corners 12 edges and six centers so uh, if you observe this carefully uh, just a second yeah so uh, if you observe this carefully uh, no matter what moves i do on a rubik's cube the center pieces don't move so i have a yellow piece here and i keep doing moves on it the all the other pieces move but the center piece does not move so i can use the center piece to characterize the color of the face so uh, i can call this the yellow face and i can call this the green face and so on uh if we go this way one important thing that you need to understand is that uh white is always opposite yellow blue is always opposite green and red is always opposite orange uh this is a standard uh, color format that almost all rubik's cube manufacturers have been using right since the time the cube was invented so yeah we we'll just go with this so uh the next is the different kind of different kinds of moves that you can do on a rubik's cube and this is really important uh, i would actually suggest you guys to take a picture of this slide uh, so that you understand what exactly each move does and because uh, if you do have a rubik's cube with you uh, there are some sequences of moves which i will be explaining later on so these moves will come pretty handy in those times you it will be really useful for you so uh, it's not a really big deal i'll explain this once yeah so uh, so the blue center piece is right in front of me so this is my front face this is the up face this is the right face this is the left face this is down face and uh, this is the back face i hope you guys are with me so uh, let's start with a simple move uh, this move that is i am turning the up face clockwise this particular move is called up that's it so this is the right face and if i turn this face clockwise it's called right so similarly if you turn any face clockwise the name of the move is the name of the face itself this is the down face and i'm turning this clockwise this is called down and so on so uh, if you turn the same face anti clockwise uh, it is the name of the face followed by uh, an inverted it that is uh, the up face when turned anti clockwise it's called up inverted the front face when turned anti clockwise is called front inverted it is denoted by a prime symbol after the letter also uh, there is another set of moves uh, this is the up face this is the up move i'm sorry this is this is also the up move but uh, it is denoted by a small u the normal up move is denoted by a capital u and this is denoted by a small u these are called double a turns essentially uh, you can see that the center piece is actually moving in the double a turns but uh, also understand that uh, double layer turns can also be represented as a normal move followed by a rotation so uh, essentially uh, you can interpret the double layer turns as uh, a normal move followed by a rotation so that is exactly why you don't consider the center piece moving at any time also uh, uh, there are some moves called the slice moves that is uh, that, that's a move in which you move only the central slice like this this move is called m and uh, again this move can be represented in terms of doing a right a left and rotating the cube so uh, the basic moves are the six face moves you do and uh, any other move can be expressed as a combination of these face moves followed by rotation of the cube so there you go so this slide is pretty important i would suggest you guys to take a picture of this maybe so that uh, we can use this later so are you guys with me 
is there anything you guys don't understand as of now so do you guys have any doubts okay i will take that as no and i'll proceed so uh, if you guys are familiar with those moves you can maybe try this out so uh, hold the cube in a position such that the white face is on top and the green face is at the front and if you do the above sequence of moves if you do it correctly uh, you will get you will get a you will get a configuration like this so if you want to try it out you can do it if you have a fully solved rubik's cube with you you can try out the set of moves and see if uh, whatever you get matches whatever is shown here uh again if you are if you want to solve it back you just will have to do the inverse of all of these moves so that is given here uh, maybe i'll pause for a second so that uh, if if at all i know someone is trying out you can try and see if it works so do you guys want me to pause or shall i proceed uh, can i have some response please So shall I proceed? Uh, saying proceed. Okay, fine, cool. So uh, once we have a basic idea of the notations of the moves on the Rubik's cube, uh, it's essential that we move into some interesting uh, properties of the moves that we can do on the Rubik's cube. So, uh, so let's go into some basic stuff here. As I said, turning a face clockwise is just the name of the face and vice versa. So up face turned clockwise is up and up face turned anti-clockwise is up inverted. So uh, if you're doing one move followed by another move, it's it's like you're multiplying them. It's multiplicative. And any x2 denotes uh, doing the same move twice. Uh, in fact, uh, if you do the same move thrice, it is same as uh, doing the opposite of that move. That is, if I turn the up face thrice, uh, it is the same as up inverted. Maybe you can try this out. It's pretty trivial. And apart from these, you have these four properties of the moves that you can do on a Rubik's Cube. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, moves on a Rubik's Cube in general do not commute. And uh, maybe I'll show this to you. So uh, if I do right followed by up, uh, whatever I get will not be the same as doing uh, up followed by right. Maybe I'll show this in a clearer way. OK, so when I do right followed by up uh, you can observe that this is not the same as doing up followed by right obviously the pieces are oriented in a different manner so from this you can simply say that the moves of a rubik's cube do not commute on the other hand they are associative because uh, as i said the moves are just like uh, it's the moves are just multiplicative so it doesn't matter uh, whether uh, I do up right followed by left inverted, or whether I do up followed by right and left inverted. So it's it's pretty straightforward to understand that the moves of a Rubik's cube are associative. And uh, the other one is the identity. Basically, if you turn a move, if you turn a face four times, it gives you back the same configuration. This is for any face. You turn this face four times, you, it gives you back uh, the original state of the cube. Uh, the other thing was the inverse. So if I do a set of moves, such as, for example, if I do right followed by up on the Rubik's cube, its inverse is up inverted followed by right inverted. 
uh, this is pretty similar to uh, matrix, the inverse of a matrix, if you're into linear algebra. Uh, the inverse of, like if you multiply uh, two matrices, let's say A and B, and you find their inverse, it will be B inverse, A inverse. Or if I have to put this in another way, uh, the inverse of wearing your socks and shoes is the same as removing your shoes first, followed by your removing your socks. Uh, so yeah. So uh, so we talked about commutativity, associativity, identity, and inverse. Uh, whenever we talk about these terms, uh, the first thing that comes into your mind is something called a set. So uh, a set is some, simply a collection of something, uh, a collection of some elements, let's say. And uh, here you see that those elements are uh, connected together by multiplication. Basically, uh, it's like multiplying three numbers. M making three moves is very similar to multiplying three numbers, I would say. So the operation here is multiplication, and the elements here are the set of moves that you can do on a Rubik's Cube. So in this context, I will talk about what are called groups. So a group is simply a set of some elements and an operation. Uh, it need not necessarily be multiplication. It could be anything. But in our case, multiplication is the operation. So the properties of, a, of some set and an operation uh, such that it becomes a group is that it has to be closed. It has to be associative. It should have an identity element. And there should be an inverse. Uh, note that we are not talking about commutativity here. Commutativity is not an important property that defines a group. So the group in our case is simply the uh, set of moves that you can do on a Rubik's cube, and the operation is just multiplication. So if I say r times r star u, uh, basically right, right followed by up, it is just as simple as saying up is done after right, or something like that. So uh, you get the idea behind multiplication, right? So uh, yeah, OK. So uh, the set that we have here, or the group that we have here, which is the set of moves that you can do on a Rubik's Cube, is an infinite group. Because I can do any number of moves I want on a Rubik's Cube, and they are huge. There are uh, so many possibilities. So it's essential that we talk about something called a generator of uh, the Rubik's Cube group. So a generator is nothing but uh, something that can help you uh, generate the elements of the Rubik's Cube group. In this case, the generator is simply the collection of all the simple face moves that you can do. So these six face moves here, up, down, left, right, front, bottom, these can be used to generate all the sequence of moves that can be done on a Rubik's Cube. Uh, one interesting thing, however, is that uh, maybe in order to look into this carefully, you can break it into smaller chunks. and you can study what are called subgroups. So a subgroup is just a subset of the group that you have uh, along with the same operation. And you should make sure that the subset is also a group. That is, a, it satisfies those four properties that I told you initially. So an example would be all sequence of moves, uh, which are obtained only out of R and U moves. So uh, with this in hand, we can actually uh, go into some really interesting properties. Which the first one of them is the total number of configurations that you can obtain with a Rubik's Cube. Uh, it's a massive number, as you can see here. Uh, just a second. So uh, you can see that this number is of the order of 10 power 18. It's five quintillion is 10 power 18. So this is actually. 519 quintillion, which is of the order of 10 power 20, in fact. So uh, when what I mean by a configuration is that uh, the the arrangement of pieces on a, sorry, yeah. So uh, just a second. Yeah. So uh, the arrangement of pieces on a Rubik's Cube is simply one configuration. Like, this is the solved state of the Rubik's Cube. This is one configuration. If I do this, it is another configuration. If I do this, that's one more configuration. If I scramble my cube, that's another configuration. 
So, uh, okay, so uh, we want to find out the total number of configurations which are possible, which, which can be possibly attained by doing moves on a Rubik's scheme. So uh, let's look at it this way. Let's say uh, I am focusing on this particular corner piece. That is the right up and front position corner piece. OK. So uh, this position can be occupied by eight corner pieces. There are totally eight corner pieces on a Rubik's Cube. So this particular position can be occupied by eight corner pieces, which are of different colors, as you can see here. So that means that if I fill one corner piece here, I have eight options. And then if I move to this position, I have seven options because I've already filled one corner piece here. And then if I move to another position, I have uh, six options and so on. So uh, I have uh, eight factorial options. Similarly, if I look at one particular corner piece, uh, there are three different orientations in which I can place that corner piece. So it can be this way, or it can be this way, or it can be this way. So there are three different orientations of a corner piece which are possible and there are eight corner pieces so every corner piece out of those eight corner pieces has three orientations so that gives you another three raised to the power eight configurations so this is with respect to the corners and if you move to the edges you can see that uh, there are 12 edges and therefore uh, the total number of ways of uh, arranging them would be 12 factorial, which is quite similar to the to the way of arranging corner pieces. And again, uh, one edge piece can be, let's say I'm focusing on this particular edge piece. Uh, this edge piece can either be this way, or I can uh, you know, remove this one and put it this way. This is another possibility. So each edge piece has two possibilities of arrangement, which is like this. So that gives me uh, two raised to the power 12 configurations. So for the corner piece, it is uh, eight factorial ways of arranging them plus three power eight ways of orienting them. And for the edge pieces, it is uh, 12 factorial ways of arranging them followed by two to the power 12 ways of orienting them. So that gives me this massive number, which is 519 quintillion. Uh, but if you do a random Google search and uh, and search for the total number of configurations of a Rubik's cube. They'll tell you that the answer is 43 quintillion. So, uh, is there a mistake that we are doing here, or uh, are we counting the same configuration twice? Is uh, is there something like that which is happening? Uh, to answer that, uh, we need to dive a little bit into uh, 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 we need to dive into another tool of group theory, uh, which is called a cycle. So uh, are there any doubts as of now? Are you guys able to follow this properly? Yes. OK, cool. So uh, if we move into cycles, like uh, as you can see here, uh, it's just, uh, let's say there are four different positions and uh, uh, one one guy goes to the next position, the other guy goes to the next position, so on, and the last guy returns to the first position. It's uh, it's like uh, it's pretty simple. You get the logic there. So uh, if there are let's say uh, four different points on a sheet of paper, and uh, I start drawing a line from the first point, move to the second point, move, then move to the third point, then move to the fourth point, and return back to the first point. That's a cycle that I've completed. So uh, similarly, uh, if there is uh, a cycle such that I'm starting from one, going to going till four, and returning back to one, followed by uh, there are two other points, let's say five and six. Uh, I am starting from five, going to six, and then coming back to five. Uh, these are two different cycles, but if I'm doing both of them together, I am writing them together. So uh, this is a cycle where 1, 2, 3, 4 is written, followed by 5 and 6 as well. Uh, 
the use of cycles is something that uh, maybe I should explain using my Rubik's cube. Okay, so uh, so let me just do this. So uh, wait a second. So here you can see that there are only three edge pieces here, which are not in their normal positions. So if you observe carefully, you can see that they have been cycled. So the blue yellow edge piece, which was supposed to be here, is now here. So which means that the blue yellow edge piece has gone from this position to this position. And similarly, the red, the red yellow edge piece, which is here, has gone from this position to this position. And then the uh, orange yellow edge piece, which was originally here, has gone from this position to this position. So this is essentially a cycle of three edges. Uh, you can represent it this way, maybe by arrows. This way. OK. So uh, if I go back to the presentation, I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, you could you can actually represent that cycle of three edges by using uh, this notation, which is given here. Uh, you can you can call it one two three. Uh, but essentially, I can also represent that cycle as a combination of two cycles, which is one two and one three. Uh, maybe I should explain this as well. So uh, let's call this position the front up position as one, uh, the front right position as two, and the front left position as three. So uh, I can see that the blue yellow edge has gone from the first position to the second position. The red yellow edge has gone from the second position to the third position. And the orange yellow edge has gone from the third position to the first position. So this I can represent by a cycle as one, two, three. But I can also represent this cycle as one, two, and one, three. So what exactly does that mean? So if this is the first position and this is the second position, I can swap these two edges first. And then I can swap these two edges. If you are able to visualize this, uh, originally there was blue here and red here. So if I swap these two edges, I'll get red here and I'll get blue here. And uh, if I swap one and three, it means that I'm swapping uh, red here followed by orange here. So that cycle could actually be represented as two cycles of swappings. So uh, that is exactly what is shown here, actually. That is exactly what is shown as one, two, three in place, one, two, and one, three. This is also called disjoint cycle decomposition. Now, what is the use of all of this? Uh, if I represent the pieces of a Rubik's cube as uh, what I've written here, like I've written u equals followed by two different brackets of pieces. So basically, uh, uf over here is the up front edge piece. Ul over here is the up left edge piece, and so on. Basically, an edge piece has two faces, and so you're representing uh, an edge piece using two different letters. Similarly, for the corner pieces, there are three different faces, and therefore you need three letters. So what exactly does this line mean? The up move, which I do on the Rubik's Cube, is basically a cycle of these four edges cycling each other, followed by these four corner pieces cycling each other simultaneously at the same time. So uh, just a second. Yeah. So if I do the up move on the Rubik's Cube, uh, let's say I call the up front position as 1, the up left position as 2, up back position as 3, and up right position as 4. If I do the up move, you can see that uh, this edge goes here, this edge goes here, this goes here, and this goes here. So basically, it completes a cycle. And similarly, uh, if you similarly if you look at the corner pieces, uh, the corner piece that was here goes here. This corner piece goes here, and so on. Again, it's a cycle com cycle of corner pieces that is completed. So the up move is basically moving, cycling four edges as well as cycling four corner pieces. This is the basic 
uh, funda that happens it's it's the same thing that happens to all moves not just up but also front back or any other move that you can do so uh, also uh, as i said earlier uh, also uh, just in this way uh, i've broken down the 1 2 3 cycle as 1 2 and 1 3 uh, similarly i can also break down the up phase cycle as something like this which you can see directly below there are six brackets that you can see over there uh, so basically uh, what is happening is uh, the up phase is cycling four different edge pieces and four different corner pieces so uh, when it is cycling four different edge pieces and four different corner pieces that can be represented as a combination of three uh, swappings of edge pieces and three swappings of corner pieces by swapping i mean uh, a goes to b and b goes to a something like that so the up move basically uh, can be written as a combination of uh, what are called two cycles so two cycle is basically a swap a goes to b and b goes to a that's a two cycle and you write it as bracket ab so the up the up move basically uh, does six two cycles uh, three two cycles for the edges and three two cycles for the corners so that's that is exactly what i mean by uh, any cycle can be written as a product of two cycles you can just split up any cycle you want into a combination of swapping pieces uh another important thing to understand here is that the cube has even parity uh what i mean by even parity is that any move that you do on a rubik's cube can always be written as a combination of even number of two cycles the up move that you saw here is written as a combination of six two cycles as you can see here uh any other simple move let's say front that you do on a rubik's cube will also have six two cycles and so any combination of these moves that you do will also be written as a product of an even number of two cycles so that is exactly what i mean by the cube having even parity uh this property is really uh, crucial because it helps us understand what are called illegal moves so what do i mean by an illegal move or an illegal configuration uh I remember i told you that every configuration of a rubik's cube can be uh, obtained by those basic uh, moves that belong to the generator of the rubik's cube group basically the six fundamental moves which are up down left right and front and back those six moves alone can generate every single configuration of the rubik's cube and all of those uh, moves uh, have an even number of two cycles which means that by doing any number of moves you cannot flip an edge or you cannot twist a corner or you cannot swap just two pieces for instance uh by flipping an edge i mean this by doing any set of moves on a rubik cube you cannot generate this configuration and similarly by by twisting a corner i mean this you cannot do this by doing any number of moves on a rubik's cube and similarly you cannot permute two pieces on a rubik's cube what do i mean by that so by doing any set of moves on a rubik's cube i cannot do this uh this is not exactly a cycle as you can see it is just one swap uh but uh, any single move that you do on a rubik's cube has to be a combination of an even number of two cycles this is just one two cycle so therefore it's illegal So there you go. Now you can understand that uh, not every config, every possible configuration of a Rubik's cube that we calculated that time was attainable. So uh, flipping an edge means that you have one configuration that's correct and another configuration that's wrong. 
so uh, out of those two possibilities you only have one possibility that's correct similarly uh, if you twist a corner piece there are three different configurations out of which only one is correct the other two cannot be attained by using any simple set of moves and similarly you cannot swap just two pieces again that's two possibilities out of which one is correct so only 1/12th of the configurations that we calculated there were legal configurations that is by doing moves on a rubik's cube you can attain only 1/12th of the configurations that we saw previously basically uh, here we obtain the number as 519 quintillion but we see that only 1/12th of these configurations are possible to be attained so that's why you get the number that's close to 43 quintillion again it's a huge number so i've not taken the pain of copy pasting it here so yeah so with this uh, we can dive into the world of algorithms so uh, like i told you before the cfop method has the last two stages being made purely out of algorithms uh, you can do it by intuition if you want you can generate your own algorithms that's completely okay uh, but the thing is uh, for all of those 57 oll cases and 21 pll cases uh, there are predefined algorithms available and uh, whenever you whenever uh, you finish the first two stages of the cube and you go to the third stage and uh, you want to uh, do some algorithm uh, it is just uh, directly available online you can just uh, search for an algorithm online and do it but why exactly do those algorithms work uh that is exactly what we want to see right now uh you can generate those algorithms using two simple tools in group theory called commutators and conjugates uh if you want you can use machine learning or deep learning generate some software that uses these and helps you find out algorithms uh the last resort is supercomputers supercomputers have a really interesting use i will talk about it towards the end of the talk so yeah what exactly is a commutator uh it is just a set of moves x and y followed by their inverses uh here you can see that uh, i've shown some examples here if you take x as r y as u and then uh, if you perform their commutator you will get a move like this this one's called the smooth and you have r prime x as r prime y as r and if you do a commutator you get what is called a sledge hammer Uh, i don't know how these names came up but these two are really important sets of moves that you uh, see in a lot of algorithms a lot of algorithms are just combinations of these four moves if you want to try out these if you want to try this out uh, you can do this move and search hammer twice continuously to get this whatever is shown in the picture so uh, why exactly is the commutator useful uh the commutator is actually supposed to move nothing but it does move some pieces uh basically the commutator is a measure of uh how uh, it, it is basically the measure of the failure of the pieces to commute uh basically uh for instance if i show you this yeah so uh let's say i take uh my x move as up and my down move as right uh, as y so x y x inverse y inverse is the commutator and x is up and uh, uh, y is down if i do x y x inverse y inverse i'll get this x y x inverse y inverse so here you can actually see that uh, the commutator actually brings back the pieces to the original configuration why does that happen it's basically because uh, x and y don't affect the same set of pieces if those two moves are independent of each other the commutator brings back the cube to its original state on the other hand if you have a move like right and up these two moves affect some pieces which are common so if you do the commutator you don't get back the original state of the cube this property can be exploited to uh, generate algorithms uh, this is one such example uh, maybe i'll show this as well 
Yeah. So uh, X in that example does this. So if you look at the top layer, the yellow, the, the corner on the up front right position alone is flipped like this. And nothing else is done to the top layer. But uh, OK, uh, to the bottom layer, there are a lot of disturbances. But if you focus only on the top layer, only this corner is twisted. Uh, now if you do uh, U2, which is Y, and then uh, do the exact reverse of X, which is X inverse, uh, you get this. And now you can just put it back to its original position. So there you go. The commutator is now used to move only these two pieces. Uh, primarily because, uh, maybe I'll show this to you again. When I do X, only this corner piece is twisted. Uh, then I do U2, which is this. Now when I uh, do X inverse, it will do the exact same operation that happened initially in a reverse fashion. And it will twist the, this corner piece in the other way. Basically, if you observe this, the, this corner piece was twisted anti-clockwise when I did the first X set of moves. Now, if I do the inverse of X, this corner piece will be rotated clockwise like this. As you can see here, the corner piece has been rotated clockwise. Now, if you complete it, that is exactly what you did. So the commutator did nothing else to the cube except from uh, twisting these two corner pieces. So uh, as you can see here, this was the example that I just ex explained. And the cube looked like this once it was complete. So uh, another thing is uh, the idea of three cycles. Uh, three cycles are a little bit hard for me to explain, as well as a little bit hard for you guys to visualize. But uh, I will try my best. So uh, for three cycles to work, basically three cycle means that you are cycling three pieces on the Rubik's Cube. It could be three corners or three edges or something like that. So uh, for three cycles to work, x and y must affect only one piece. I'm, I'm still focusing only on commutators. I'm using commutators to move pieces on the Rubik's Cube in a way that I desire. So uh, if you take this example, uh, the first move was R U R prime. That is X was R U R prime, which moves uh, this white, red, green corner piece out of the down face. Everything else in the down face is normal. And then Y is D. And uh, if you do X inverse and Y inverse, it cycles three corner pieces, these three. Yeah, these three corner pieces. So uh, what exactly is happening here? Uh, X is affecting only the uh, this corner piece from the down face. And it is bringing what was originally this corner piece to the down front position. So it is moving this corner piece here and bringing this corner piece here. So then I do a D move. And when I do X inverse, it will do the exact reverse of what it did. It will basically bring this corner piece to this position, this corner piece to that position. So it is affecting three corners in total. As you can see, these three corners have been cycled. So there you go. That is a three cycle. Uh, so this is the use of the commutator. Uh, another example of a tool that I can use to generate algorithm is, algorithms is the conjugate. The conjugate is simply x, y, x inverse. Again, there are a, there are a few examples that I've shown here. Uh, uh, if you remember, I had talked about OLLs, that is orientation of the last layer. And whatever algorithm I have done till now is an, are examples of OLLs. So, uh, so these two examples, again, are examples of OLLs. Uh, you can see that the smooth appears in the middle somewhere here. Uh, so y in this case is r u r prime u prime, and x is f. So when you do, these, when you do this move together, you get 
something like this a diagram which is shown here basically what this means is that the yellow pieces are the ones which appear on the top and the gray pieces are the gray colored squares are different colors that you don't care about that's all uh, it doesn't mean that the square is actually gray in color or something like that it's just that you don't care about those colors okay so uh, why is the conjugate useful basically it does the exact same thing twice but at different places so uh, x when you do x it does something to the cube and uh, y is actually what you want to do to the cube okay when you do x x is like a setup move you set up that situation then you do y and then you invert it back uh, that is the nature of these algorithms so basically uh, if uh, x affects one corner piece let's say and uh, once you do x that corner piece is affected and why basically what why does is it reorients the cube in such a way that that corner piece is pushed away and some other corner piece comes into position and then x is inverted back so basically it affects two corner pieces so i hope you get the logic behind this uh one example of the conjugate is the ua permutation so uh i will actually uh I'll, I'll show this here. So x in this case is f two u. So basically, what this algorithm does is it cycles these three edges. Okay, give me a second. Okay, so if you look at y, that is m u two m prime u two. Uh, remember m is the slice move i was talking about so i'm just doing uh, the y set of moves first so if you observe m u2 m prime u2 it has actually cycled these three edges the one over here the one over here and then the one over here i'm sorry the one over here it has cycled these three edges give me a second uh yeah okay so uh what the y set of moves did here was uh it was basically cycling three edges which were in these positions if this is my if uh yeah if this is my up face uh basically what the y set of moves was doing was it was cycling this edge this edge and this edge so i want to cycle these three edges so what do i do i want to put uh, the idea would be to put these three edges in these three positions that is exactly what the conjugate does so uh so when i do f2 u uh the three edges that i want to cycle are exactly in the positions which are mentioned in that loop and then i invert it back yeah so i hope this is clear maybe should i explain this again uh are you guys following this is this clear everyone you guys have any questions i got one response which says it's clear okay cool so uh this is one example of the conjugate so uh you, there is yet another use of the conjugate uh that is you can generate one algorithm uh out of an existing algorithm by using a conjugate which is similar to what i just explained right now uh i'll show this to you again so uh, you have what is called the t permutation which is shown here so uh, basically the t permutation swaps these two edges that is the these two edges and these two corner pieces 
So uh, basically, the arrows are shaped like a T. That's why it's called the T permutation. When I do the T permutation, it looks something like this. So as you can see, the yellow orange edge, which was supposed to be here, is now here. And these two corner pieces have been swapped. That is what the T permutation does. It swaps these two edges and these two corner pieces. But let's say I wanted to swap these two edges and these two corner pieces. I would want to bring these two edges to this position, right? That is exactly why I use a conjugate. I do a setup move, basically, which is R frame, U frame, F frame. Now you can see that I have brought these two edges to where originally the two edges need to be so that I can perform the T permutation. So if I bring these two edges to these positions and then do the T permutation and then set it back to the normal position, I will have these two edges and these two corner pieces swapped. So the T permutation swaps these two edges, these two edges, but I want to swap these two edges. And that's exactly why I want to bring these edges to this position. So I do R prime, U prime, F prime, which brings those two edge pieces to where originally the T permutation swaps the two edges. And the corner pieces are in the usual positions only, so it's not a big deal. Now when I do the T permutation algorithm fully, and uh, invert it back. Oh, just a second. So yeah, R prime, U prime, F prime, and do the T permutation. You can observe that I've actually swapped these two edges and these two corner pieces. You can see an orange yellow edge piece here and a red yellow edge piece here. Basically these two have been swapped and these two corner pieces have been swapped. So this is the use of a conjugate where you can build one algorithm out of an existing algorithm, which is the T permutation. So uh, that's pretty much what I want to talk about algorithms. Uh, there is an interesting number that I would like to talk about beyond this. It's called the God's number. Uh, given the kind of numbers we have been dealing with with respect to Rubik's cubes, we dealt with numbers of the order of quintillion, which is of the order of 10 power 18 or even 10 power 20, in fact. Uh, this is a similar num This is not exactly a similar number, but it's it's another number uh, that tells you something about the Rubik's Cube. Uh, can you guys go ahead and give me a guess of the order of magnitude of the God's number? We've been talking about numbers of the order of 20. OK, fine. Somebody just pointed. It's 20. It's 20. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. So yeah, what is the God's number? Uh, it is basically the maximum number of moves required to solve a Rubik's cube from any given configuration. Uh, it it is kind of surprising because uh, there are so many different possible configurations of a Rubik's cube, and uh, someone goes ahead and says that you just require a maximum of twenty moves to solve it from any different position. So uh, how exactly do we obtain it? Uh, basically, it's again simple math. So, so uh, any move that I do on a Rubik's cube will lead me to a different configuration. If this is the solved state, this is one configuration. If I do this move, it's a different configuration. If I do this move, it's yet another configuration, and so on and so forth. So if I do, if I'm going to do my first move, I have 12 different possibilities. I can turn this phase clockwise or anti-clockwise. So for one phase, it gives me two possibilities. And there are six different phases. So there are 12 possibilities of moves that I can do. OK, so let's say I've done my first move. So for the second move, uh, I have 11 possibilities because, again, I have all of those six faces and I can do two moves on each face except the right face. Because when I do the inverted move on the right face, it flips my cube back to position one, which has already been counted. 
So uh, for the solved state of the cube to bring it to some other configuration, I have 12 possibilities in the first attempt. And uh, for the next move that I do, I have 11 possibilities. Similarly, for the third attempt onwards, for the second attempt onwards, it's just 11 possibilities for each attempt. That is uh, the move that I can do so that I can bring it to a different configuration. So uh, if I keep doing this, the number of configurations that I reach would be 12 times 11 power, how many ever that is. So uh, if I want to take into account all of the configurations which are possible on a Rubik's cube, uh, I will have an inequality here. And uh, if you solve this, it will give you n is less than or equal to 19. So n is the count that you're taking after the second move. So the total number of moves, which is which includes the first move, will be just 20. OK, just a second. This is not 20 factorial. This is 20. It's a simple number. OK, so uh, why is this God's number useful, apart from the fact that uh, it is just a simple number? Uh, we'll have to go into this. We'll have to go into speed cubing to understand that. There is a really interesting use of the God's number in speed cubing. Uh, so I hope you guys are probably sure of what speed cubing is. But for those of you who don't know, I'll go into this link and show you what it is. Yeah. There you go, that's speed cubing. Basically, it's the art of solving a Rubik's cube as fast as possible. So uh, this was recently a world record. Like It's not the current world record, but it was one of the world records that happened. So give me a second. Yeah. So that guy is Felix Zemdex, who did the former world record of 4.22 seconds. He solved a Rubik's cube in 4.22 seconds. The current world record is 3.47 seconds, and it's held by a guy from guy called Yu Sheng Du from South Korea. Uh, the use of the gods number is that it could potentially place a lower limit on world record timings. Uh, let's say uh, uh, the gods number is 20, which all of you guys know. Uh, uh, let's say if you take the example of Felix Zembegs, uh, he does typically uh, 10 moves per second, let's say. And uh, now the normal methods of solving a Rubik's cube, which is the CFOP method or the Roux or any other method that I showed you there, uh, out of those four methods, you take you take any method and you solve a Rubik's cube. Uh, typically, uh, they will help you solve it in 50 or 60 moves at most. So uh, if you're doing 10 moves per second, and if you can solve the cube in 50 or 60 moves, that means you can solve the cube in five or six seconds. OK. Now, the God's number says you can solve any configuration in at most 20 moves. Uh, so if you're able to do 10 moves per second, and if you're able to solve your cube in 20, sec in 20 moves, you can basically solve the cube in two seconds. Uh, but nobody has done that till now, primarily because uh, in competitions like those which you saw just now, uh, you must have actually seen Felix Zemdex uh, staring at the cube for a, uh, for a few seconds before he actually started solving it. So that is actually called inspection time. So in a competition, uh, they give you inspection time in order for you to uh, inspect the cube and decide the first few moves of the cube. Basically, you can only decide the first few moves of the cube. You cannot come up with a solution uh, of solving the entire cube in just 20 moves in under 15 seconds. Nobody has done that till now. If someone does that and uh, if he does solve it in 20 moves, and if he does 10 moves per second, maybe he could create a world record of just two seconds. Uh, typically, you must have seen these some of these robots creating world records for solving a Rubik's Cube as fast as possible. I think the current world record is around one second or something. I'm not sure. Uh, those robots do exactly something like that. They actually scan all the sides of the Rubik's Cube, and they actually generate solutions of uh, which contain uh, 20 or less moves. And uh, obviously, they will have greater physical physical and uh, 
analytical capabilities than human beings. So obviously, they would be able to do those moves faster as well. So yeah, this is why I think the guards number is pretty useful in uh, figuring out how fast you could solve a Rubik's cube. So if you're really into speed cubing, uh, you can check out channels like these. Uh, if you're a beginner and if you want to explore uh, the world of speed cubing, you can try out this website called youcandothecube.com. That's where I began. Or if you really want to improve your timings, you want to become really fast at it, you can try channels, these YouTube channels, or you can also try these web pages. Bob Button's web page is a really good web page. That's where I learned most of this stuff. Uh, also, uh, you can also go and look at the last link just for curiosity. Uh, this website called cube20.org actually contains uh, information about a Google supercomputer which actually experimentally calculated God's number by looking at so many different configurations of a Rubik's Cube. So if you're curious, you can go and check out this website called cube20.org. Uh, it contains some interesting stuff in there. So yeah, uh, that's it. That's pretty much it from my side. Uh, like I said, this talk was born out of a simple Google search. And uh, most of the links that you see here were in those uh, in the Google search that I did. Uh, most of the pictures I used in this talk were taken from Bob Burton's cubewiz.com. You can go, out and go and check out his page. It's a really good page. Uh, the last link is actually my personal blog, where I've written a few posts on how you can come up with algorithms using just commutators and conjugates. So if you're free, you can check this out as well. So yeah, that's it from my side, guys.